Tell me about uh, rebranding from Grofer to Blinkit. Like, what's been the hardest part of the last eight, nine years as an entrepreneur? Where Blinkit has been betting on is, you know, we are a urban phenomena, right? We are not going to be able to do 10 minute delivery in rural India. I would hate to be the person who says, I am a founder, like, I'm special. So, like, yeah, I need to sure. be treated special. I think everybody goes through the same life journey. Entrepreneurship is consuming and a lot of people who have come and sat here have reflected on the fact that life got away from them. Density of houses is going to go up, Yeah, right? Retail spaces are going to be at a premium as well. I would like nothing more than going to a local market and having experiences. The space for that is quickly running out. It's unbelievable how younger consumers think so differently from slightly the older ones. Over the last week, it's been raining here, mm. right? We were getting 8,000 searches for umbrellas. And within two days of us getting those searches, somebody actually came up to us and said, I want to sell umbrellas on your platform. So that's entrepreneurship. Uh, guys, welcome to The Barber Shop. We have with us one of the OG founders uh, of the second wave of entrepreneurship, as we've been calling it, uh, through season one and season two. Uh, season two has been about, uh, you know, uh, about, uh, I'll be, I don't know whether you've seen, but season two was called Razor's Edge. Mm -hmm. We collected... 30 crores from um, uh, friends and you know well wishers of the of, of the barber shop, and we got startups to come in, and we wanted to deploy around one to two crores per startup, early stage, post revenue, but first or second round. Mm -hmm. So we've now invested in five companies, uh, and that's what the second season was about. But the first season was about conversations with entrepreneurs, uh, which saw a lot of love, and there was a lot of demand to bring that format back into season two as well. So. Uh, the first uh, of of that uh, of of the of the OG format is back. Um, we have Al uh, Albi with us, Albinder Dhinsa, the founder of Blinkit, earlier known as Grofers, um, and privileged to have you, Albi. Uh, right absolutely, you know, thrilled to uh, uh, one actually for have to have Bombay Shaving Company and Bombay on Blinkit and kind of grow with you, but uh, more for our listeners to uh, kind of peel the onion on your story, first with Zomato, then with Grofers, now with Blinkit, running a public company. So welcome and uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Uh, so this is an open conversation, man. Uh, I wanted to actually start with what we spoke about in your offices, mm -hmm. which is, you know, the ins and I was kind of seeing your 31st December, hour by hour, what category was going up and down. And even when we spoke, the conversations were about the insights that are coming into consumption of groceries and staples and now food given that you guys are mm -hmm. operating in both. But tell me a little bit about, about this transition from Grofers to Blinkit 10 minute and now what you're seeing with consumers now getting so used to ordering two, three times a day and 10 minute deliveries and how that's changing habits and so on. Yes, I think, you know, Grofers also, we launched the first app in 2015 as an express service itself. Okay. That's how we actually people got to know us because we used to do delivery in 90 minutes. Uh, but that business itself we realized was not going to scale unless we invested in infrastructure. And the infrastructure is uh, for us was not key, you know, do we need delivery partners or do we need, uh, you know, just warehouses. It was, okay, how do we uh, actually provide the kind of services for sellers that will essentially make sure that if it's a more efficient way for them to sell into the market uh, than any other platform which existed. And that took us on a journey with Grofers where we experimented and we came up with a few things. We were very, very lucky to sort of keep, you know, uh, I would say just surviving year on year and figuring out that, you know, okay, this is what we need to do better and this is the kind of tech that we need to build. Uh, to the point that in when the first wave hit uh, of the pandemic in 2020, we realized that, you know, one, we were vulnerable. The infrastructure that we were building and that we were providing, it had too many like failure points. And uh, we also realized that, uh, you know, cities itself were now becoming the sort of hub of the supply chain itself. Um, I'll explain what that means. If you have a warehouse in the middle of nowhere, which is where I'm going tomorrow morning, uh, <laughs> I'm going to Dasna. It's like uh, ahead of Ghaziabad. Okay. Uh, 
it's essentially like there are there are two villages close to like that warehouse, right? Uh, and that's great in a way for that community because there is employment generation over there. But that's it, right? Uh, whereas, you know, when you move into the city, uh, and let's say there is some you know, job that you need to get done, you know, whether it's a small warehouse or it's something else, the amount of labor force that is available to you, the liquidity of talent which is available to you is just like incredibly higher, Correct. right? And it's, it's <clears throat> extremely skewed. India as a country, we still are small villages, very large cities, right? You don't find villages which are, you know, villages or communities which are extremely large outside of the large cities. So then in some way the infrastructure build up in the cities is actually leading to clustering of job creation within the cities which means that all the liquidity of the labor force that you need is inside the cities, right? And that was actually the leap that we took, okay, now we need to go back to the express model and we need to like somehow capture this supply chain uh, ability which lies in the cities. Uh, so we started our first dark store in uh, with a partner right to actually right next to your office uh, July of 2020 and uh, we just realized that okay this works better it came off a very different insight but we realized we could do deliveries faster we had seen the rise of Getir in Turkey we were very intrigued by what 10 minute delivery why does it work for customers uh, so we tried it out and we realized that people love it we don't know why <laughs> <laughs> But yeah. over the last three years, I'm assuming, like there is, like like I told you, right? Mm -hmm. It's 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 probably the stickiest habit. I think far more. I think it's stickier in my view than OTT mm -hmm. as an as an entertainment consumption. It's stickier than, in my view, Amazon Flipkart buying also. Yeah. No, because it is right now. I don't do that regularly. I yeah. do it once in a while now, and I, there's now an equilibrium of. When I do it, I do it two three times, and then I forget about it for three four months. I'm assuming that's how it is for most people. But with with, with Blinkit, it's literally every day and now my life has revolved around it. The help at home now counts on it yeah, you know, yeah. from a purchasing standpoint, so it's very, very real. We've also released a household app for the help okay. at home or for the parents. Like if you have a household and uh, you just want them to add things to cart and you will check it out. Hmm. Like that happens with my mom, <coughs> that, you know, she's not going to, <laughs> like I just don't want her to be paying cash every time. So she can create a cart and then I can check it out. Uh, so we just launched that just because you mentioned the house help. Uh, <laughs> wow. So, but I'm doing that for my parents as well and like, you know, just to sort of uh, uh, make their life a little bit simpler. Uh, of course, they don't like it that, you know, I have oversight now into what they're buying. <laughs> uh, and I'll remove that biscuit with extra sugar. But uh, uh, I think uh, the it's in, it's been a very very interesting journey like i think 10 minute delivery uh, there's a lot of uh, you know there was a lot of misunderstanding about how it happens right uh, all of that i think has mostly like sort of people have understood they've moved on uh, but i think from a consumer behavior perspective right uh, we've realized that it's driving two things one it's actually driving a lot of discovery Okay. Of sort of new consumption patterns, right? Uh, so if you look for at for you or for the consumer, for the consumers. Oh wow! Okay. Right, which is why emerging brands are doing much better in this channel, right? It's about access. At the end of the day, it's, you know, all of everything that we do, it's it's basically related to access to products, to services, and I think ten minute delivery just makes it simpler and easier for folks. That you know, I have this need of accessing this product and I should be able to get it. And on the other hand, uh, it's the opportunity for you, for a lot of the other sellers. Uh, very interesting story that I heard today, right? Like over the last week, it's been raining here, mm. right? Uh, we were getting 8,000 searches for umbrellas. And within two days of us getting those searches, somebody actually came up to us and said, okay, I want to sell umbrellas on your platform. And we're like, did you have our data? He's like, no, but I see that it should happen. So that's entrepreneurship. That's amazing. Somebody actually like decided that I use this service, it's raining, I want an umbrella, it's not on here, it would be an opportunity, so let me go and talk to these very guys and say that I will bring the umbrellas and sell them on the platform. Wow. 
right so i think these are the two big trends which are you know the one is great for consumers the other is great for supply right correct and i think that we need to be able to provide these platforms to my earlier point that e-commerce is going to be infrastructure for large cities it is going to be part of infrastructure uh, this is what it is right but if you don't have this platform right how is this person going to sell umbrellas <laughs> yeah right uh and it was the guys who came and did this there actually two of them from uh, they're like 3 4 years out of college they've been running like random small businesses mm. they used the service right needed an umbrella searched for it didn't get it they're like yeah that's an opportunity <coughs> unbelievable and umbrellas are fairly predictable in terms of purchase patterns they're predictable like they're they're not i was mean, just kind of thinking about it they might not have be high holding costs and so on so It's Somebody easier. will create a brand out of it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, that is true. Right, but they need to have the channel to be able to do it. And yeah. it's not we are not going to create brands. If we create one brand which is blinked, that would be awesome, right? Okay. We are hitting like we have our hands full. But like you guys are building a brand, right? Most of the emerging uh, brands that are also coming up, right? They're in spaces which are like you would never thought that these were white spaces either right well, somebody's making your you're making shaving cream somebody's making toothpaste somebody yeah. else is making you know uh, food healthy snacks yeah, yeah. Uh, somebody will figure out how to build or build a brand in the i would say rain space yeah. right like yeah. they will say that okay we are uh, and it's not unfathomable it exists outside of india oh for sure right like you see the patagonia west and all of that stuff yeah there are like brands created around weather weather yeah, and classical use cases camping in the us for example yeah. very classical yeah. use case north face for example yeah. very classical use case no i agree but uh, i'm sure like the data coming your way i want to actually explore two things you said one is on the on the migration of 40 crore people to cities over the next 15 20 years yeah. right which is crazy thinking about jams like we were just talking before the shoot started mm-hmm. about traffic jams in gurgaon delhi itself right but what that means but also kind of i i just did the bombay nagpur highway mm-hmm. and i i studied in nagpur for mm-hmm. my engineering mm-hmm. uh it is unbelievable how good that highway is and the yeah, moment yeah. like the center of the country is connected to the financial capital of the country through a road that is just beautiful mm-hmm. like you can do 100 kph on it consistently we are immediately in our company we are starting to look for a where to start moving the bombay warehouse closer to nagpur mm-hmm. like he, and i'm sure if we are thinking about it yeah we are also thinking about, are thinking about yeah. it and then that's how un, like the bottlenecking of, of cities will probably happen if you have like 50 such roads connecting s- like smaller cities to larger cities mm-hmm. hopefully that allows for you know for this pyramid of city to village to kind of become wider and taller both So hmm. I want to explore that. Ki wo kaise ho raha? Uh, but the second, the one I think I want to explore earlier is on just learning about consumption on Blinkit. Like you told me last time that the category that sells the most, or at least for some period, was was condoms, for example. It still is. It's the second highest searched item by new customers on a platform. Are you serious? Yeah, it's crazy to think about it. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, Like Those, it is our investor, Durex and Rekita like are our investors. They'll yeah. be very happy to hear. They are. They are doing like great business on the platform itself, right? Uh, I don't have the insight around it. We have data around it. So, and I think that sort of, uh, as a company where we are right now, is we are still we still are processing data. We are not generating insights. Not yet. Not yet. I'm, I'm sure it's tempting to right, like to see what the first cart looks like, what the fifth cart looks like. I think that we can do. However. Uh, see insights we need to generate so that uh for they enable folks like you that are on the platform yeah right uh i don't think that the kind of sort of insights that people think e-commerce platforms generate uh are you know that customer churn is this or that i don't think that that's really helpful that this customer is going to apply a coupon code this is not going to apply a coupon code i don't think that's how if you look at a long enough time horizon that those are the value creating insights that we will get right but 
to be able to sort of give a platform to brands, right? Uh, it, I'm sure you guys also have access to it. We have a platform for brands to actually come in and see insights and to be able to market to customers directly. Yeah. I think those are the things which we are not yet, we, we have not been able to process yet, right? And I think that's a journey that I'm hoping that we cover this year where we start generating useful insights to actually give people the why behind the data that is showing up. Currently, we don't have those whys. And I think that's that's where we need to get smarter as a brand and as a partner to brands. That how do we actually help people get from data to insights? As it's not an easy journey, by the way. I'm sure it's not. not an easy right. So is, does that mean that analytics and like data science becomes a big pillar of your tech or generally of, of Blinkit's raison d'etre? It is already the case for a for different parts of the system. So for example, data science, uh, you know, is a very, very crucial part of our supply chain already. Okay. Right. Because if you think about it, uh, you guys have worked with our sellers, right? You Your stuff probably reaches some warehouse from there. It goes to 400 dark stores and goes to the customers, all of that stuff. We have a six-person tech team that runs that entire I orchestration. See. That's it. Wow. That's right. Insane. And I think there are around eight crore products that sell every month on the platform. All of them are going to move through the supply chain. Uh, all of the data is going to get generated. It's going to be tracked. And you will not find a ton of manual intervention over there. It's just scan to scan to scan. And then, you know, even uh, for in instance, when uh, you guys get the prompt that you need to send more stuff to this location. Yeah. Those are all automated. There is not a human being that's actually doing it. The logic, the uh, how much quantity, where, all of that is done automatically. It's merged and then it's sent out to you guys. That here, you need to be in X, you need to send X things to Y location. Uh, so I think that's been a part of the supply ecosystem for a while. Data science, customer insights have not been part of our, you know, sort of, user consumer journeys yeah and i think that's something that <clears throat> will see us do a lot more uh, yeah. you guys will see us do a lot more that's not something that the customers probably will yeah for sure yeah. for customers for customers it's about infra the thing for brands it's about insight and for customers it's about infra yeah. and they're two very different things yeah, yeah no like an infrastructure business is very different it's about like ruthless operations and hardcore tech while a uh, Inside business is about consumer, marketing, partnerships, like relationships. I saw a post of you with Amul. Right. right. I cannot imagine the kind of inside generation on a category like milk, which is actually a very established, yeah. penetrated category in India, can be created given what you now know, which I'm sure would be super exciting for an Amul or a mother dairy to know. But they're two very different companies, no? Like, how, how, how does someone like you who runs the ship kind of manage? Because I always feel companies are built on DNA. Mm -hmm. Like mining companies are built on operating DNA. Banking companies are built on lending quality DNA. Like, you typically have a DNA that defines your guy, but these are two different DNAs, or, or is that not the case? I don't think that's the case. Okay. I think we often, we want to think of it that way because it helps us partition this. But, uh, you know, one, something you said that, you know, Infrastructure is uh, ruthless execution, right? It is not infrastructure. Like we have, uh, what, 15 odd thousand people that work in the stores uh, through our partner network, through our own stores, uh, in the warehouses. We have another 30,000 riders, right, every day on the roads. Uh, I think operations also run on culture, right? And that culture is down to very simple things that how do you know theft is not going to happen, right? What are, if you're just, if we start thinking ourselves, the only way that we could survive, especially in India as a, a operating company, uh, and the only way we could survive as a ruthless company is if we have, we were a monopoly and there was basically like some reason for it to, us to exist other than customer need, right? That we basically could not be pushed out of business, right? Otherwise, operations run on culture. You treat your folks on the front line, uh, in stores, 
you basically have to keep working and repeating the same message and that that message is exactly the same message that a techie in Bangalore will hear as a frontline worker in Bombay will hear right wow and I think it's the same culture you can't have two faces over there to say that I treat this differently and I treat this differently right so we do a weekly town hall in which the entire front line is there uh, you know 400 store managers partners it's like I have to say the same thing to them because the techies are also on the same call the marketers are also on the same call uh, in fact we've had some of the brands come and talk on that call uh, and the message that we wanted to deliver to our front line is that look this is your impact if you open the store you send it you send the stuff you're making the consumers happy these guys their business is growing and they're creating more jobs and they're doing all of this we have to keep repeating it we are not great at delivering that message but i think it's the same culture then that has to be uniform and you have to be mindful that you are at the end of the day a tech and ops company right it is not or you don't have a choice to be one or the other today you are a tech and ops company at all points of time wow you struggle with that not really no yeah Well, like it's very different like the with the contextual background of a delivery partner or of a dark store manager it will be very different to the contextual background of an iit engineer so you would you'd be extremely surprised yeah well you know flesh is the same they're both human beings similar needs just different levels of needs that's all but, but motiv- motivation is the same you approach a you run a company right if you go and you chew out a techie today for doing something wrong and you are unfair to them or uh, you know you will see their motivation level drop tomorrow correct or maybe today itself right and you will see people respond differently this exact same thing happens on the shop floor uh, the same happens with the partner store network right you have to be you have to give context at every single place right if i tell our delivery partners that you need to deliver an order you know this order is going to be delivered in 7 minutes right we have to give them context we can't tell them that you know hey guys like you know uh, you need to order deliver the order within a given time give them context you tell them this is what you promised the customer this is how the brand gets built this is how it's good for you good for us good for the customer right in our company for example you're right i think you're right i i wonder why we struggle maybe a little more or maybe we have to be we need to kind of learn the right cultural unification of the core message in your case for example i was seeing uh, zomatos not blinkit specifically i was seeing zomatos hiring jds and you know uh, chief of staff to the ceo i think there were five six which were doing the round on linkedin mm-hmm. <clears throat> but the first bullet point in each of them was the same um and it started with a something around passionate about doing the best for our customers for our consumers and something like that mm-hmm. and i i was seeing all of them and i was like cool the first one is the same and that looks like what the company stands for in our case for example if you look at our sales force no mm-hmm. our on field sales force like offline sales force which goes to Mm-hmm. one lakh stores and sells in them and tries to merchandise they are in a place where they are getting tracked on beats every day mm-hmm. um they have very clear crystal clear revenue targets they have to shuttle between 60 skus and two brands um it's a very army like structure mm-hmm. and that's how sales forces generally are right there the someone at the top and it's hierarchical and it's target driven and it's the same thing every day with a massive incentivization if you do well on the other hand our marketing team just by the nature of the job is a lot more creative uh, has to kind of do things which are more artistic mm-hmm. needs a lot of time to think things through um uh has to create content and do stuff like this and i struggle for example for our sales force to understand our brand marketing because i'm not able to like if i if i if, for example if i tell my head of sales ki i need them to come into a marketing session just to understand how brand is my head of sales like it's you will confuse them 
you have to give them very simple messages so that they're able to do exactly what they're asked to do otherwise it, if we give five messages and become and i've seen that like even larger more established companies have a clear distinction between marketing branding and sales sales typically gets branding mandates but isn't a part of the branding process and that's where i start struggling a little bit ki i need to now tailor messages for my marketing team separately my sales team separately and so on so it was a lot of difficult over there but I, i think you guys are kind I think of trying you to figure out the way to get out of that loop it will save so much of your time if you just have to deliver a single message yeah and i have a belief that it exists right but a lot of the reasons why uh, we do this is because fundamentally there might be black holes that we have created in the way organization is designed in the way maybe performance management is designed right that you end up not like the reason that you are probably delivering multiple messages is because there is something some system that you have created which is leading to this bifurcation of people yeah. and then that leads downstream to similar talent coming in and then that loop just perpetuates that Correct. this the sales force becomes a separate entity in itself and yeah. has a different culture of its own correct right uh, and then you can't sort of change it so i think that's a you know uh, it's i think if you change your objective function and if you change objective function maybe of 20 people in the organization that this is going to be a unified organization our sales guys we are going to hold our sales guys to a higher standard and say you are going to understand the marketing message and we are going to tell our marketing team that you know they need to uh, have the empathy to know that whatever ma- messages that they are putting out are going to be something that the sales guys are going to be able to get you are right i think it's a it's a difficult thing to do to do to have a unifying message for the organization like uh, you can always have a unifying vision mm-hmm. and you can have a path through the vision but operating mandates which are kind of unifying are tricky for us but tell me one thing i think uh, just coming to the earlier question around giving access to brands and i see you do that a lot uh, you know you are you are you were with ahana from open secret with bharat from rage coffee they are like brands that are with with shashank from the whole truth uh, you know of course where you work with us we you know uh, what are you seeing with with these companies and how how are they different from i'm sure a bulk of your business of course will be from the levers and rackets and colgates yeah, yeah. and proctors of the world right what give me a sense of how how your team kind of operates with both of these yes yeah, so actually we are still learning i think okay. we don't have a, a complete handle on how can we be a good partner for both large brands small brands is a very different needs you know uh, the reason we started focusing on emerging brands was uh the service that we're building right we think that they are the ones that stand to gain the most from that right the access that our service can generate for uh, these brands so it's a business call at the end of the day good for us good for you good for the customers customers are looking for these things you can make them available on our platform that helps us do better business uh however the understanding for us is also that you know to be actual good partners we need to actually get to know what these brands are what they do uh because unlike uh, let's say levers or a png there uh, they have global knowledge and they have just done this for so long that their templates are set for this is how we are going to go ahead and we are going to do this so with them we don't we don't need to make an effort right we launch something their their people will get it they will understand or they will connect the dots from somewhere and they will start operating uh this is our experience from working with uh, store partners right like the people that run our our stores mm. that for a while we were operating uh you know they were operating our stores and we used to have these conversations with them which were i would say less than pleasant right <laughs> uh and across the spectrum right uh to the point where i think once we started actually you know talking to them understanding where they're coming from uh the tools we were building for them the tech that we were building for them right uh recon all of that stuff we just started seeing a major difference in how they treated us and how sort of we were treating them and uh how much less noise and dispute there was and actually we started seeing a cultural shift there where they actually started worrying about customers right like they were not just saying really? it's my store your customer it is our customer 
uh, the quality of input started improving. So that actually was sort of a penny drop for me at that time that, you know, to be able to do this early and often with partners, you know, that development of our ecosystem, who does it benefit? Right. If Blinkit becomes big, who are the people who that are going to benefit from you? It's going to be brands like yours. It's going to be the entrepreneurs who wants to sell umbrellas. Yeah. Right. Uh, so how do we understand them better, faster, earlier? Because the what we are doing in India and Blinkit is a very contextual 10 minute business to India. It's unlike anything else that exists out there. Right. That's like uh, if you even if you look at Europe or Turkey, wherever the 10 minute models have existed there, they have skewed more towards indulgence. Right. We are selling iPhones as well. Right. That's insane. <laughs> right. Uh, so we think that, you know, this is the development stage of a new kind of channel. Yeah. Right. And the people that are going to gain from it are brands, small emerging brands, entrepreneurs. So we need to learn with them very early like we need to learn how they are gaining we need to keep that on track so that we actually build very different kind of products there is no template for this business out yeah. there agree it's not like you know you'll go and say Ki, this is amazon of x country no it's not it's not yeah you're building i think you're 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 building the plane as you fly it right because i'm sure every day is kind of new it would be a fair characterization to say that new brands is where your betting growth will come from while uh, bulk of bulk of transactions still happen with you know kind of leg legacy brands because that's what people consumers will generally have a velocity to purchase. Yeah, I think a uh, or a right or now we are in a I think for the near future in India in urban cities we are in a consumption boom which is more supply constrained than anything else. You oh you think so? Yeah, for sure. Right. Wow. Uh, you increase supply in low locality in a neighborhood consumption is going to go up. It was the last year's example, ice cream. Uh, last year we had six brands of ice cream on the platform, right? Uh, this year, and the summer season is yet to hit, right? Uh, I think we're already at 30 odd. What are you saying? Right, and that number will probably be up by the time uh, actual summer starts hitting North India. Uh, and who, where are these 24 brand of ice creams mushroom from? Basically, there are so many brands that have been set up local here, there, all of them want to come and list on the platform because the ones that were there last year, they had, they just, they just saw such a huge boom uh, to the point where now Blinkit this year is going to have the largest last mile cold chain in the country because our four, 500 odd stores, all of them have now have refrigeration, like large scale refrigeration where almost like 20, 30 percent of the store is actually like temperature sure. controlled uh, and that basically means that there is more supply of ice cream which means and you can get it in 10 minutes so like more people more people bought ice cream on our platform I think last year than they, we had done in tire growers right uh, you see so when you increase supply uh, because in general <coughs> consumption is growing in the country but would that would would that be more applicable to indulgent or kind of immediate gratification yeah. kind of category, soft drinks, ice creams, chips kind of thing, as opposed to shaving. I, I don't know whether supply will increase sh like shaving or yeah, maybe personal care. Personal care is, is booming in this segment, right? Because you see, part of it is also choice, right? Uh, so far, uh, consumers, uh, you know, somebody gave me a very cool analogy, which is, uh, I was in Ahmedabad recently and uh, uh, they had opened up like a, one of the massive malls that is opened up in Ahmedabad, I think, uh, Alpha One or something, okay. Ahmedabad One. Mm. Uh, yes. They had opened a store there, right? And their analogy was that, you know, the malls are a platform for a brand, mm. right? Uh, because essentially that is how, if, if there were no malls, like if there is no mall in the city, we can't enter that city, right? So if you think about it, like, uh, that's actually a very cool insight that, you know, malls are also like infrastructure that creates supply so yes. that people can go there and that allows other brands to <coughs> mushroom. Absolutely. Right. So malls are a platform, right. Uh, and we view ourselves as that now that, you know, if we create this, 
it creates space for more people it creates more efficient space for more people to be able to show their products to customers to your point if uh, if it's a need based category right uh, we see this push and pull with sellers a lot right like do i go with just a large brand where sale is guaranteed versus i give a emerging brand a shot mm. because they don't want to get their working capital tied up in one versus the other Correct. right uh, but we see this push and pull uh where sort of initially they will sort of want to be on the safer side and just keep to the larger brands mm. and what we see is that the sale happens right uh but once they start diversifying customers start actually buying other products because if you put it in front of them then now you have a choice if you don't give me a choice i'll buy the same toothpaste i bought every single time correct but if you tell me that this one has i don't know new kinds of flavors sure i'll give it a shot you know i've this is so different from the classical marketing so colgate is also an investor with us mm-hmm. right like you talk to any seasoned marketer at colgate or in the oral care space they genuinely believe that toothpaste is probably one of the most loyalty driven categories there is like people won't change forget about old to new people won't change from their regular toothpaste to even an a legacy toothpaste which is similar but different to them 20 years back or 15 years back that's what i was going to say so Ki- data is not data doesn't point to that data is actually showing younger switches. customers will switch very happily in oral care which in is oral amazing care. that like people are very careful about that broadly they are but they are also like looking at products which are coming i think the founders of perfora were in office today yeah uh, or yesterday uh i mean they're they're booming on the platform right they're a young brand as well uh, and i think people are trying out their product maybe the gateway product is not toothpaste it's probably their brush Electric or brush, something yeah. else something else right um i think we are going to see with both disposable incomes being higher younger population living by themselves more urbanization in cities all of these are trends which are going towards people are going to ask for more choice and that creates opportunity just just that creates opportunity but it's amazing i'll be to think that a category jahan pe toothpaste is a 10 rupee broad aov in india if you look hmm. at the yeah, 10000 yeah. crores of toothpaste bought aov is 10 rupya and 10 rupees ka 11.5 bhi nahi hua in the last yeah, yeah. If, if at a broad level but in this case perfora is probably like 10x or you know the premiums are very high which is exactly what we saw with china 15 20 years back like yeah, yeah. people just started premiumizing very very quickly in categories that were not expected to happen yeah, yeah. and oral care is we are we are betting on it right like yeah, as a company yeah, we are betting on it i'm i am very bullish on that because we see that and and i see the maybe it doesn't happen in 2 years or 3 years or 5 years but we clearly see it like you know people will premiumize on a lot of things right and of course there are huge business to be built on the non premium categories as well right and that kind of goes across the spectrum right but where blinket has been betting on is you know we are a urban phenomena right we are not going to be able to do 10 minute delivery in rural india right and within the urban phenomena right it's very very clear to me at least <coughs> that pop density of houses is going to go up yeah right retail spaces are going to be at a premium as well right we need to find more efficient ways of creating supply yeah right because people i would like nothing more than going to a local market and having experiences right but that needs to exist there needs to be restaurants and cafes and you know places which are providing me experiences right and the space for that is quickly running out wow if you, so. if you think about delhi right <clears throat> you were living in south delhi uh it's a very different city from when i used to call go to college there 20 years ago right just those live spaces have disappeared and again there are some <coughs> mediums right uh for example uh, menstrual care uh typically has been a sort of you know harder to talk about category but like times are changing there is such an open conversation about yeah. it it is still not there where we would want it to be but the, there is definitely a positive step towards better conversation and when channels like us come right it suddenly like becomes a much more accessible thing right yeah. uh i mean my wife and i we were out in the market the other day like we were uh, eating at a restaurant and she had her period so we just 
ordered uh, you know tampons while we were there in the restaurant in the restaurant are you serious yeah and it was like yeah i get it the school service <laughs> <laughs> oh wow that's that, that is also i think like for example we also in, in our bombay brand we have we have you know we have menstrual hygiene it's unbelievable how i think younger consumers think so differently from slightly the older ones and i think the the rate at which people are changing is i, I don't think we have i don't think we recognize it in our company yet i think every generation is is that right like but bahut fatafat ho raha hai like now every 2 years for example a 23 year old employee at bombay shaving company is significantly different from a 26 year old is significantly different from a 30 year old to a 35 to 40 but 35 and 40 mein itna farak nahi hai to be honest and 40 or 50 mein itna farak nahi hai jitna 25 aur 30 you know uh, 23 mein maybe it's a number of you know uh, ott channels that are <laughs> that were available to us when we were yeah, growing up the rate of change is quite crazy but amazing yaar like how exciting is it for you to be at the forefront of like something which has not happened in the world in a country as complex as india which brings me to my earlier question on the broad infrastructure development and macro trends that are happening over the next 15 20 years uh today's stock market aside but broadly i think uh, do you do you do you see this as a like what a lot of people call as the tipping point for the I don't country know, actually I, i mean would be wrong for me to sort of opine on that i have as zero idea about it i have some of the things which i was mentioning are more our beliefs and what we think is going to happen and that's what we are placing our bets on that the consumption is going to go up uh i think the there is not a tipping point i think it's just going to be gradual it's just going to be uh because we are in a supply constrained market right to your point about roads from nagpur to bombay yeah uh we are way behind in development of physical infrastructure that moves goods throughout the country yeah right we don't have enough uh, you know cargo trains moving yeah. around the country uh we don't have enough roads that can support both commercial traffic and recreational traffic right so i think we are just chasing that uh, across the board yeah and some of the things are going to create better answers right uh where we will be able to leap for some of these changes uh i think fundamentally what uh has been different uh, looking at india has just been that you know when i go back to my hometown i go back to a lot of these places uh, which are uh what we call tier 3 tier 4 cities the urbanization isn't sort of getting there fast enough urbanization is still concentrating in the large centers in india because the nature of uh, early development of what kind of industries came up what kind of uh, you know the bpo sector came up now tech and a lot of these and tech is a very small part of the whole thing but i think just the nature of how we've expanded there is not you know we don't have large factories opening up in tier 4 tier 5 towns yeah. like what happened in china yeah and i think that creates a unique situation over here where we are going to have a uh, concentration of urbanization yeah. right and i think that's <clears> going to be different for us than it has been everywhere else like i was in the us i came back right. on friday on friday only that's right and wahan pe matlab like there are so many things that are just solved for you know yeah and we are we are still behind we are very very far behind matlab i mean we are at what 120th the gdp per capita to like actually be able to make that impact as well right my dad ran like the reason i went was he ran the mumbai half marathon remotely in san francisco got it um and uh, uh, he's a he's 68 years old but yeah. a fairly fit fairly well he, he did a 22 km run yeah. he he ran like 1400 km last year got he it. does like that kind of guy right yeah. um my but, dad too by the way my dad is like 72 he runs 10 km every day 6 days a week yeah as a and he just you know ran like for 2 hours came back to the apartment my brother's apartment yeah. and collapsed in the lift oh damn yeah i collapsed in the lift my mom and my brother were with him yeah. it was not responsive for like a minute or two but then okay. he kind of woke up and was yeah. lucid so Got it. they were like okay but for those 2 minutes it was crazy immediately 911 call <clears throat> from incident to paramedics arriving was 4 and 1/2 minutes nice. from paramedics arriving to hospital bed doctor attention was 6 and 1/2 minutes Wow. So in 10 to 11 minutes, 
it ended up being severe dehydration and cardiac pressure it was not a cardiac yeah. episode yeah. but he has had a cardiac episode in 2013 yeah. so it's not like it was a new thing he's on medication yeah um it was more a blackout yeah complete blackout yeah. severe de- like it was cold so he was not drinking as much water because he was not yeah, yeah. the exact same thing happened to my dad like, oh, really but he was not running at the time he was just he crashed his car in dholapua because he passed out driving uh because not having got he didn't not have water since morning and it was cold and like he is aap pyaas nahi lagti na ha to but but how how long back was this he was this was i think 3 years ago 3 4 years ago 2019 jan thank god like it was yeah, yeah. came out unscathed came out unscathed the car was like like the car went into a bus but and my mom and my niece was with him the car took the hit and like great like wow. yeah, so that's why i went there and i was Like, but now he's doing better oh yeah oh yeah. within 3 4 days within 3 yeah. 4 days he was like let me go for a run my mom to had a go at him you see like he, like she 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 got the you know the mother load of you know i told you so moments so <laughs> she keeps telling him you you run too much you 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 don't realize she genuinely believes that jo pain ka signal hota hai na from body mm. to brain that mm. you are thirsty you are in mm. pain that my father actually physiologically does not have that hmm. like she thinks there's a problem with him and they keep their i think 80% of their fights are about about this particular issue ki tumhe pata nahi chalta like you are ta- he'll be he'll be like i'm i'm not sleepy i'm not sleepy i'm mai thaka hua nahi hu 2 minutes later he's snoring yeah. so she's like this is obvious there is dissonance in what you say <laughs> what you do so ye matlab the now we have to take care of you and he's like then you're not allowed to go out alone so yeah. he's obviously pissed off and i told him now bear with it अब गलती करी आपने पानी नहीं पिया तो नहीं पिया मॉम्स राइट यू कैन देयर नो आर्ग्यूमेंट टू बी मेड बट आई इज मच बेटर ही इज आउट ही इज काइंड ऑफ वॉकिंग अराउंड ही इज इज कंप्लीटली ओके नाइस दैट्स गुड दैट्स नाउ आई वांट टू आई विल बी काइंड ऑफ एक्चुअली गुड सेगमेंट टू अह इनटू योर स्टोरी यार लाइक यू नो लाइक यू यू सेड यू वर काइंड ऑफ यू फ्रॉम अ टियर टू टियर थ्री टाउन व्हाट टुक यू टू अह आईआईटी एंड देन व्हाट गॉट यू टू जोमैटो and then what got you finally into entrepreneurship because would love to explore that like what's what's home like what was childhood like childhood was fun yaar uh, kahan the aap where where do where was i grew up most of the time in patiala okay uh, so my family is from close to town called sangrur uh, i know sangrur very well yeah so uh, i grew up for the most part in patiala okay. great place like you know uh, good school so i don't think he, there was any uh, you know people usually when they ask me ki i don't think there was any dysfunction which led me towards entrepreneurship <laughs> right it is just ki okay like you know uh, good uh, good place to grow up uh, extremely lucky and grateful that you know uh, one was decent at sort of uh, studying and all of those things <laughs> that that come with it and uh, uh, and grew up in an environment where essentially education was valued very highly valued Uh, what do your parents like what 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 did they do for us yeah mostly work? farming they're from a farming background uh and uh so that but there was something which uh i think for both my mother uh my mother especially uh was very very like sort of focused on making sure that we get a good education because i think uh to her somewhere the idea was that you know we have to move out of the village we have to sort of you know sort of keep making this progress uh, and that there is nothing back there so like you better you know do something with your life and uh, and that was through education and right? when you say we this was you and your siblings uh, i have an older brother okay uh, so he was actually the one who was i think smarter and <laughs> uh, bore the brunt of like expectations <laughs> because the go to career is that if uh, you know you have to be in civil services oh really yeah so he ended up doing that oh really <laughs> he's still in the civil service yeah he's still there uh but he i think you know he he helped create the path for me to just kind of do whatever i wanted to do mm. uh which was again extremely grateful for that uh i think uh college just happened because you know that's a very J-E-S. simple story that you know if you are smart you have to either be a doctor or an engineer uh and uh, ended up coming to college uh had a when were you at iid delhi iid delhi no yes when 2000 2004 okay uh and i think sort of uh people from my batch and maybe like a year here and there 
we were also extremely lucky for uh, the timing where the age in which we were sort of getting up. So it was pre-smartphones, mm. but uh, mobile networks were building up, yeah. right? And it was, I think I was in first year of college when the dot-com bust had happened, yeah. right? Uh, and so when we graduated, there were not like jobs, et cetera, had not sort of come back. Um, so I think a lot of people from our years ended up in, uh, you know, 2004, 2005, sort of, you know, looking at alternative career options, which are not that go and work at a bank or go and work at a tech company. Correct. Uh, because the opportunities were just not there, the market still hadn't recovered. Uh, but I think that allowed, so I went to the US to do my masters and then I was uh, working there uh, in New York and then San Francisco for about five years. Oh really? Yeah. What what, what like what was your field of specialization? I was uh, in consulting, I used okay. to do like transportation consulting and design, like sort of a little bit of tech and uh, okay. so it was a good interesting, you know, got to work with a lot of smart people there. Uh, and then I went to business school uh, and my first year. Where I was business school? Columbia in, okay, New, in York. New York. Yeah. Uh, so Dippy uh, and I have been friends for a while. So Was he your batch at IDM? Yes. But we knew each other even before that. Uh, we There's something called NTSC. The, yeah. yeah. So we were both like from Punjab state, like in that NTSC, uh, NTSC cohort. So we knew each other from back then. Wow. And we ended up in the same school in Chandigarh and then in college. And uh, we've been friends for a while. So he called in 2000. 11 when Zomato was just taking off oh. uh, and I kind of was getting bored at business school. Uh, I think I had done enough of partying uh, there. <laughs> so uh, I ended up coming back uh, in my second year. You didn't complete the thing, is it? Sort of completed it, but like never really went back after that. But you could finish that with, this, you know, I got a degree eventually. <laughs> uh, uh, but I think that was sort of the journey of, you know, discovering and what was really exciting and still is, was, you know, just the sheer scale of opportunity, like, you know, uh, and I think that was true in 2011 and it is still true today yeah. that we are still so early in the, in the journey of development, in the journey of, you know, opportunities that are getting created because <laughs> the market is going to develop and I had seen US, I had seen US in the recession 2008 as well. Uh, and I think that just, so there was no like special moment for moving into entrepreneurship apart from looking, working at Zomato, seeing the India growth journey what and being the- What was call like, first call like, like what was that, what was the, like what was his, his pitch to you to like kind of leave Colombia and come? But 2011, I don't even remember what Zomato was, what was Zomato like at that time? It was very small, I think, maybe, 20, 30 people, like uh, roughly, like, maybe 50 people, I don't remember. Uh -huh. uh, no, I think, uh, uh, you know, he was obviously looking to tap into the people that he knew that would take the early risk of actually coming and working with him. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and I did, right? I don't think that a lot of convincing was needed. Uh, it was a great place, great culture. Uh, and uh, people really had a sense of ownership, right? The business was growing, right? This was purely restaurant discovery business. This right? was purely restaurant discovery and business. Uh, dine out, it was uh, like dine out was... Both dine out and delivery. Uh, at the, but there was no f online ordering. It was delivery just... Delivery was No, no, it was just a discovery platform for delivery ah. as well, right? So you could call that number and... Correct, correct, correct. Uh, so there was no online ordering at that point. Uh, and I think it was like extremely interesting to be a part early part of that ecosystem seeing that organization go up scale up uh, you know and i think um, there was some level of confidence that okay like there are so many opportunities getting created can we do this can i do that uh, and when i left zomato uh, to start grofers uh, i think that was also with the same sort of like oh my god there is still like so much opportunity and there is so much that we can do. I, I actually never felt that uh, it was a risk, risk that I'm taking home. My regard. What if it doesn't work? If it doesn't work, we'll do something else. Like, how does it matter? Mm. Right. The coolest moment, I don't know if you ever saw, we had the silent store, which is basically operated by uh, folks who are, uh, you know, deaf and uh, mute, right? And like, uh, 
these guys, I mean, Paul and uh, Vivek who have come with me, they, they also went there and it's an experience, right? And it will change your life when you go and see that store. It will change mm-hmm. your life. Like it's, it's an entirely different perspective. It was very funny, we were doing, a, I think, an interview with one of the TV channels in that store. And uh, one of the guys walked into the frame and everybody's like clapping and like shouting and then they realize that he doesn't hear. <laughs> right? It's just that little bit of, uh, that little moment was like, we, are, we, are, we don't understand their world at all. At all. Right? Yeah. Uh, so, Going there is an experience, you should go actually, I'll uh, be happy to host you. It's in Lakshmi Nagar, East Delhi. Wow. But what was that, um, what was that uh, flip point, like was it, was it just opportunity? Because you had seen something in restaurant and you said, okay, groceries and staples seems to be a lot. Like we didn't start as a grocery and staples company, we started as a logistics company. Okay. Uh, we used to provide a delivery service for local shops. So if you were a chemist or a grocery store or uh, any kind of store basically, uh, you know, everybody did home delivery in India. So it was home delivery as a market. And which is the largest market? Is, 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 is it still Delhi? Uh, it's still Delhi. Okay. Bangalore is fairly close, but it's still Delhi. And does you being from Delhi, like you know, the headquarters being in Delhi, does it like... Is oh that yeah, yeah, of course. Right. Uh, although... Because the unique way that I like to joke about this in the company that because the unique way that we operate, right, we all also seem to like mess up the things most in Delhi than like anywhere else. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think just because uh, our business is uh, reliant on a few things, right, it's reliant on like the kind of products that are sold on the platform. Uh, so the connections that we have with, you know, offline stores, with sellers, with brands. We just end up like being, traditionally we were extremely more sort of north focused. It's only in the last one year that we've really started making inroads into uh, Bangalore and uh, into the western cities. So Bombay is also doing well. Uh, but it's only, that's that's a fairly new look for us. We were uh, much more sort of focused on North India. What's, the, what, like, what's been the hardest part of the last eight, nine years as an entrepreneur? Was it, a, was it a growth ambition driven cultural? Uh, uh, I think it was fear driven, right? Fear yeah. of failure. Uh, that made me take decisions at some point or start forcing some decisions, which then ended up seeing the culture go in a bad direction because uh, it was no longer, you know, uh, it was too much top down. Uh, and then you had the good people leave because they say it would like. If my opinion is not valued, then I will. Why am I here? Give me an example. Like give me an example of what, like a decision which kind of. Yes, in uh, so I was mentioning right, 2015 we used to be a 90-minute platform. So early 2016, I think there was you know we were in a good position. Uh, we had uh, we had the largest market share in the express market. <coughs> uh, we were struggling with the service quality at that time, and I started forcing the organization into ki no, we are going to like you know. Uh, really, you know, made a lot of decisions without being enough data centric or thoughtful about, you know, whether this is actually the right business decision. Those are kind of those decisions that you, that are born out of overconfidence about your own magical touch, <laughs> right? And, uh, and yeah, and, and that ended up putting the company into a spiral, like a growth company was put into a, a negative growth spiral uh, by me, single-handedly, by making these dumb decisions and forcing people to follow them. <clears throat> did you not feel there was a corrective mechanism, like, or did you? Were you like, were you? Sometimes founders, and for the right reason, sometimes feel that only they can see mm-hmm. what others can't. So we'll back their instinct, even if other ten other people in the room are saying this is not a good idea. So were you not listening to the organization or the board or investors or whatever, or were they not telling you because they just believed that if you thought that that was the right path, then, then that probably is because you are seeing things that they are not. Listening. I was not listening. But so there were people who were saying that this is going to be yes, tricky. Yes, yes. I was not listening. So it was overconfidence. It was brashness. That 
we were young enough as an organization that there was not enough trust in the team uh, with me for people to stand up to me as well and that was a negative loop right yeah. because the you know because the good people will leave right uh, was there a moment when you realized okay fine something needs to change or was it like i think it's a moment it's like you know you get slapped <laughs> 50 times maybe on the 49th slap you start getting it that <laughs> Also, that Grover was one of the one of the most capitalized businesses, young companies. Very quickly, right? You raise money. Yeah, yeah. Like, which is where the overconfidence market. came from. Is it? Yeah, of course. Say more about that. Like, did you feel like money in the bank was a pro? I, I, I do it. Like, for example, when we raise, I always feel like it's it's like having a full tube of toothpaste, right? Suddenly, yeah. we're like, boss. Every yeah. every time, I'm just going to like take a whole mm-hmm. whole yeah, whole chunk yeah. of it, and you know, you're like, okay, that's the way to. Yeah. get the best and then you can't finish it when it's about to end you're like you're like okay fine now i need like take small small amounts <laughs> yeah. because yeah but you you take very bad calls uh, but but in your case it was obviously very 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 you know like the most marky investors yeah uh, very quickly uh, was, was no, i think we had a good team and you know we've been lucky who was so. your early team like who who your co-founders and Yeah, so uh, Saurav was the co-founder in Grofers with me. Mm. He's uh, right now on some world tour. But we have, I think, we have almost sixty, sixty odd people at Blinkit who have tenure of seven years or more. Oh, really? Yeah. So uh, we've been able to preserve a large part of the okay. early on the ground culture. But tell me, give me a sense of uh, how much capital did you raise, and about about how that journey, like how. Twenty fourteen was kind of exuberant, mm-hmm. and then twenty sixteen, twenty seventeen, it became a little tricky, and then of course the pandemic hit, and now twenty one, twenty two again was exuberant, and now again there's mm-hmm. you have seen like two three cycles. How like how was your capital raising journey? I think did, did you ever plan for it? Did it just happen? It just happened. We actually never even went out. Even when we were a small company, we never went out looking for capital. Uh, when we were doing the B two B business for uh, local stores, we were small, profitable output. really uh but you know had our own challenges with working capital all of that stuff uh but otherwise it was you know uh we were more focused on the business huh. from that point onwards i think when we started doing well uh, people approached us we were able to raise capital uh over the lifetime of grofers we raised about 550 million dollars total wow right almost 200 million had been deployed just in the infrastructure build up that we had And of course, some of that went into stupid marketing that we did. But, <laughs> uh, uh, stupid marketing is yeah, <laughs> like everyone, everyone, every, yeah, everyone's kind of. <laughs> yeah, everyone knows what what that is. Yeah. yeah. If you were to do it all over again, would you <clears throat> would you raise the same amount of capital? Probably not. I think it's very you know there's uh, doing the could have, would have, should have scenarios uh, in hindsight. I think at that point of time, uh, you're when you're in the middle of it. I think if you roll it back, you'll probably end up doing the exact same things again. Yeah. Right. It's very very difficult to have that journey with more context. And in general, uh, my view is that if you have access to capital, you should raise capital. Right. But does it lead to like with the toothpaste example? Like, does it lead to like? I think it's so hard to not be inefficient when you have capital. Like it's just it's very hard. Like because you, it's not about bad habits as much as it is about. Uh, at least for me, and what I what I'm saying is it's about uh, unflinching belief that you you will always get ROI on it. You will always shorten time spans. You will always shorten return windows, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Very hard to figure it out. And then, like you said, you would end up going into you call it brashness but you know, like i would i would assume that there are certain variables of stress or pressure of growth quarter on quarter given given you know given given allocation pressures you like what else can you do i think it's training also with the benefit of hindsight mm. right uh, you get better with utilizing your toothpaste <laughs> with, after you've seen a couple of these cycles and you've seen yourself uh, and the team sort of make the same mistakes again and i think the other thing is that in uh as more companies mature go public 
uh, are exposing themselves like new age startups are exposing themselves to public scrutiny see the public market cares about what's on the table yeah right they care about these are the numbers yeah. that's what the decision is going to be made on yeah it is underappreciated how good a discipline driver that is yeah right say more about that i think you just have to show up every day and know that you know you have 90 days to put up your nest set of numbers and uh, those numbers are that's the only truth that is going to exist out there yeah right you're not going to be able to uh, go out there and sell a vision uh, you just don't have the forum anymore right and uh people are no matter how good uh, we are or we think we are uh we are going to be subject to the scrutiny of here are here is what the numbers are going to say and they are not going to lie yeah so you know you better make sure that they, they tell the right kind of story right that's the only thing that we have and maybe we'll get you know a few chances to maybe get it wrong but not for long to be honest in food delivery there i've always heard that this would be a winner take all or at least many people thought but it's just been the case that people have a for some weird reason people have a preference in the food delivery not so much mm-hmm. in the uh, in in your space but in food delivery people have there are some people who are zomato there are some people who are swiggy and they don't really move between i've i've done this a lot like I ask people a lot ki do you order on Zomato or Swiggy and I have noticed that many of them don't even have the other app right. on the phone they do it on one maybe just consistent and then those kind of market like those consumers have stuck and then kind of uh, yeah I I don't have an insight as to why that is but I know that that's the case it is right yeah <coughs> it's, a, it's because there is incest incestuous movement everywhere else hmm. between Uber Ola you know between amazon flipkart depending on the category or mm. discount or whatever but in this case i think it is not moved at all as the movement is very little like there is just comfort with one and i don't know whether mm. it's because food discovery is a you want to order quickly because you're hungry maybe uh, i don't have an insight there but yeah i i see the i know that that's the case uh, right, right and i see it in my behavior be of people around <laughs> me as well but you Like oh you you we would have been Zomato. Guy. I was Zomato. <laughs> still loyal. <laughs> Tell me about uh, rebranding from Grofers to Blinkit. Like that 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 would have been a re- you 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 spent so much time and money building Grofers the brand mm-hmm. and the identity and like for me like again mm-hmm. brand is so such a viscerally important thing. Mm-hmm. You know like we are so close and careful about the feelings that someone. gets when they see our logo mm-hmm. or when they you know see a, some identity of ours mm-hmm. to change it was that why, why did you do it and how think, hard or easy was it i think grofers had become very associated with a certain kind of um, you know service you know we What were staples, kind of? staples we had fewer sellers fewer brands on the platform uh, and it was mostly targeted towards a different kind of clientele mm. right uh and that was also a good market like frankly like you know being able to uh provide this sort of service and convenience to you know uh slightly lower income segments uh that was also like a very fun building exercise uh but when we moved to this 10 minute then it was an entirely different um business that we were in all of a sudden and uh, we really wanted to sort of <coughs> rebrand uh, so that we also sort of change our people's mindset about who we are right that we are we didn't want to carry around the baggage of grofers uh, there is good there is bad yeah. right we didn't want to have the baggage we wanted to think like a 10 minute first company and uh, i think we looked at a few names uh, we got blinkit and then paul created a excel sheet and i think it took him one week to rebrand the entire thing one week start to finish wow it that, that's actually interesting because you thought about it from a business first standpoint rather than a con- like rather than a consumer first one mm-hmm. right like we can afford to do it right we are platforms maybe it's very different for 
brand which is a product that people use and they put it on their face and they 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 are actually like interacting with it and that stands for something we just stand for convenience uh, again like i remember cyber city may you had put those you know yeah, yeah. we are now blinket and yeah, yeah. um but it was amazing because it actually i think the name what like what are the other names you were kind of toying which came close to consideration oh i don't remember at all i think i saw blinket uh and then think there was blink the blnk uh which we also have but i don't remember what else was there do you remember huh runner was there, runner was there for some time mm. uh yeah i don't remember actually what else were we considering because blinket was such it was just so good that once yeah, it was in the picture everything else was done right Uh, so I just remember that you know, okay, we we can get blinket. I was like, okay, cool, let's go. <laughs> and uh, now, like, what are you looking forward to now? Um, in terms of, you're obviously you you were thir- you were thirty thirty one when you started up. Yeah, now I'm forty. Now you're forty. Like, yeah. does um, do priorities change? You clearly are someone who has who has embraced humility and you know very like you're very honest about. the fact that you made you know that that things happened in 2017 which were you know a result of a lot of things you, people don't accept that usually uh, as as easily as you do so is 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 it a function of age and what are you like what are you looking forward to from 40 to 50 for example like what what do the next 10 years look like in addition to of course to blinket kind of um, going but personally for you i don't think i have any like sort of personal goals like even i think wherever uh, i am today like I'm genuinely also telling you, right? It's probably like at the 49th slap I got it, <laughs> right? So maybe there are another 50 waiting for me, and and I will see sort of where we end up. Uh, I think uh, really sort of the joy of building, the joy of building with smart people. Uh, I think I've started appreciating that a lot more. Say more. Uh, I think I used to earlier have this notion that uh, you know. <coughs> achievement and the building uh, to some certain milestone to certain outcome uh, is uh, going to be the fun part mm. right uh, and i think i never really understood why people say uh, no it's the the act of building the you know in hindi mein tapasya kehte hain that is actually the fun part right uh, and i think i've started appreciating that uh, and appreciating that while not letting go of ambition while not letting go of the impact that you want to create and really like finding deep meaning in the impact that we can create right and i think now i seek that versus sort of waiting for it to come to me right that's i think something that changed in the last 3 or 4 years that you know the joy of the journey versus the joy of the destination is always you always look forward to things a lot more for the process than for the outcome i mean i think for you're right we forget about it in this target driven you know entrepreneurial world where sometimes we get consumed by the output our outcomes a lot more and we forget to enjoy the process and i think that leads to that leads to that can lead to burnout it can lead to just unhappiness like it just can lead to a lot of negative spiraling as you call it uh, how where do you derive energy from to outside of blinket to kind of like do like what 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 keeps you busy outside of the office i think not much mostly like it's either working out or you know spend time with you know family friends or loved ones uh, i think that's about it and like work is really enjoyable for me like so it, i think i'm i'm working most of the time Uh, we as an organization we are still extremely metric driven we are yeah. still extremely like we have to do this we have to do this we have to do this we have to follow xyz processes and we have because at the end of the day we are moving so many things and it's yeah. such a hard business to run yeah. there are so many moving pieces plus scrutiny now scrutiny yeah. i think that's a out, output metric <laughs> right like, uh but i think i really enjoy it and i think you know uh and I think we encourage our folks to also enjoy that process to show up because they actually enjoy it if they start treating it as just a workplace I think 
uh, we will not be able to run this complicated a business. Mm. Right. So, I think that's pretty much all I do outside of. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have kids? No. By choice. By choice. Is that a is that a trade off you have made because you are an entrepreneur, or you would have would you no. made it? And no, I think I think it was just uh, there was. I don't think that it was even a trade off. Although that's something I would not want to talk about on the podcast yes. because sort of between uh, me and uh, my wife. But uh, I think we just never sort of had the plan to sort of do it or even felt like, okay, you know, this is something that's missing in our lives and we should actually like try to go for it. I have a niece. Uh, she lives close by. Your so brother's daughter. My brother's daughter. So I get to uh, see <laughs> get her. Good part of it. <laughs> yeah. And then you can send her home and say, like, <laughs> the, the stuff you take care of, which is not enjoyable, I'll take care of the good stuff. Yeah. But, but the reason I asked you is not, not, not from any other standpoint, but more from a entrepreneurship is consuming. And a lot of people who have come and sat here have kind of reflected on the fact that um, life got away from them you know, in many ways. Some, for some, mm. it was about fitness. So, Nita, for example, mm. was all, like, held fitness very close because she felt like that was something if she loses, uh, then then it, like she loses touch with all of reality, which mm. becomes all consuming from, from a building company standpoint. Yeah, I think maybe you're right. Right. But it does. Uh, I also feel that, you know, if to each their own, right? Like, I. I would hate to be the person who says, no, like, you know, because uh, I'm a founder, like, I'm special, so, like, yeah, I need to sure. be treated special. No, I think everybody goes through the same life journey, right? It's how we look at ourselves, I think, is, is, is basically what is going to drive whether you're happy, whether you're not happy, and, uh, you know, how charged up you are. Interesting. But tell me a little bit more about, like, the, you know, what Paul was saying, in terms of the some of the really interesting consumer insights around what people are searching for. We spoke about, of yeah. course, uh, you know, umbrellas and condoms, but generally, like, w what has been, like, the ex super exciting, totally non-intuitive stuff that has come your way? Yeah, uh, I think the first one was last year, uh, which was, I remember, you know, that was our first actual 10-minute marketing campaign. Paul and I worked on it. Uh, and it was basically around, uh, the insight actually came from one of our partner stores who basically was seeing sort of what 10 minute delivery is doing and that was one of the first stores which had crossed 500 orders. Mm. And the partner actually just casually told somebody in our team that, yeah, why are you selling your money on your money? My whole family is selling it. Right? And that person was smart enough to come and mention it uh, that to somebody in the team that, why don't we sell like gold coins, gold coins at the Dhanteras? Uh, we were like, it's a good thing. <laughs> Point. Uh -huh. uh, and we we took a bet last year uh, and it did really well. Uh, and the partner uh, himself, he was telling us that, you know, basically they also then perpetuate in their community that, you know, you should buy this Dhanteras, you can buy his coins over here. And then we realized that it's actually a pretty big pain point because you have to buy it that day. And then there are huge lines yeah. for folks to buy. And I didn't even know that people buy it, mm. right? But then we were able to solve. So this time we had multiple uh, sellers. Last year, I think we had to do it with only maybe convince one or two of them. But this year we had multiple people selling coins on the platform. And then uh, I don't remember for what it was, but we started getting searches for cow dung cake. Uh, <laughs> what, what is it called? It, <laughs> no, that's what we call it. Kapli, chapli or something. It is oh, called. Is it? I don't know. Yeah. So Does like, I know? Up, upla. Up, aise kuch hota, right? Okay. Yeah. So I didn't know that. That's what it means. <laughs> we first thought that's a typo. Ah. Like somebody's looking for something. What's the intent here? And then one of the girls in the team was known. Like that's what you use in puja. Like that's that's actually a word. Uh, and we're like, see, yar, humne to Angrezi vaisi si ki, matlab sari umar koshish karke. Like this is what we should have known already. Uh, and then uh, the interesting bit on that has been, and I think we have one of those videos coming out recently. Uh, this one seller group that we work with, uh, 
they were able to source that within two days and oh, really? put it up on the platform in North India. Mm. Uh, and they're like, "Why did you do that?" They're like, "Malab, we just sent our people out to figure it out." And uh, then they ended up creating a fairly deep network of all of the stuff related to puja. Uh, so they went all the way to West Bengal, where. uh they make the you know lakshmi ganesh murtis all of that stuff uh and they're like fairly young guys uh, so we made a we uh, now made a video to sort of showcase them mm. but they actually went there they figured all of that it out and now they're like just selling on the platform and suddenly like random stuff will appear and we will not know why they have put it and then suddenly it will start selling sometimes it doesn't as well but for the most part they've been getting it right and it's very you know small spaces right uh, we are seeing also some of the other brands some of these aggregator brands global bees uh, these guys also get into these like small niche spaces yeah right uh, i saw the other day we were selling uh, there is something which is called uh, sneaker cleaner and it's like why do sneakers need their own separate tissues right oh. <laughs> but apparently it's a thing and it sells yeah and i didn't even know it existed but somebody has figured it out and they are selling it on the platform yeah like very premium would you buy 10 minute sneakers would you buy sneakers if you could get them in 10 minutes i i would probably do it i i am the kind of customer if you can give me anything in 10 minutes i'll take it yeah. I, like i iphone in 10 minutes it immediately made sense to me ki ha abhi chahiye because now i'm leaving for office mein ko chahiye to chahiye office mein jaake laga lo na sab i'll install it there yeah lot of people are saying ki Why will someone buy an iPhone in ten minutes? Like, yeah, I think, I think the customer who's buying an iPhone, right, is going to be okay getting it in ten minutes. Yeah, right. I think uh, the seller with which you work, Unicorn Retail, I think they're one of the largest sellers for Apple in India. Their one request was, guys, please don't charge delivery on the iPhone. Like, we're charging customers enough. You don't need to put your fifteen rupees delivery <laughs> on top of it. <laughs> we, we will give you extra commission. Please don't charge delivery from our customers. That's like okay, cool. Wow. We actually have to build that feature because that's a default across the platform. And they're like, okay, fine. We'll we'll exclude the iPhones. Fifteen <laughs> <laughs> bucks on a ninety thousand rupee. Like, I, I, but the would it make a difference? Like, no. But it was just like they they had this as a special request because you know they are also users consumers of the platform and they're like, ki yar, baaki sab kuch theek hai. Dek. डिलीवरी चार्ज नहीं लगना चाहिए इस पर मैंने ठीक है जी नहीं लगेगा वाह नहीं बट आई थिंक लाइक धनतेरस गोल्ड कॉइन्स इज अ क्लासिकल एग्जांपल ऑफ समथिंग दैट सीम्स नॉन इंटूटिव या लाइक ऑन द लाइक ऑन द फेस ऑफ इट बट देन सडनली स्टार्ट्स मेकिंग सेंस मोमेंट यू से ओके यू नो आई वांट इट इन 10 मिनट्स बिकॉज़ एबीसी व्हिच इज द थिंग राइट एंड दैट वाज अ लकी ब्रेक फॉर अस दैट यू नो दिस इंफॉर्मेशन केम अप फ्रॉम अ पार्टनर थ्रू इट वाज नॉट इवन थ्रू द यू नो मार्केटिंग चैनल राइट इट वाज एक्चुअली through our operational channel mm. like a partner store somebody who runs a store mm. uh, mentioned it to the ops team which then just got mentioned in the right place for us to pick up that insight and as an organization like that's extremely hard to build these listening like uh, you know from like the ground level listening mechanisms that really like you are a brand mm. right i'm sure you guys are hungry for what happens at the moment of consumption of your product yeah right uh, and i think building that is incredibly hard as an organization right especially in our category it's inside the bathroom it's private it's very hard to ask cuz you themselves don't know right so for us it's like it, this is like in any insight even in the universe of this mm. will be super valuable to us yeah hopefully we'll provide something i don't know and they are purchasing level because wo bhi nahi pata hota na humko like consumer kya feel karke purchase kar raha hai kar rahi like we don't know especially in hair removal which is the more we realize it is a very is a very beauty category like for for example someone like me who loves a fully clean shaven head mm. or someone like you like so very you seem to be someone who shaves every day mm-hmm. um or a woman who likes like her eyebrows shaped a particular way so very engaged use case but a very private purchasing behavior mm-hmm. you don't discuss it uh, you won't like it's not a community it's not like food where you kind of consume as, an, as a community right mm. so for us any insight is is super helpful even mm-hmm. if it kind of it's along the periphery of the consumption story yeah i've uh, i haven't actually seen a lot of insights come out of the uh, personal care space yet 
but hopefully you know they should uh, i think by the by the time uh, we we also launched a beauty a separate store and a separate segment mm. uh, different actual stores uh-huh. that we are running with different partners uh, we are very i think cautiously optimistic that as a category we'll have to treat it differently but it will be good for the platform to be able to sort of get into the whole you know beauty and personal care space in a bigger way yeah and you were mentioning gifting earlier by the way we are okay. gifting going live tomorrow i think really So you like kind of you we'll gift wrap stuff. You. We'll pack it for you. Notes and so on. Yes, everything. That's beautiful. For us, gifting is a big use case. Yeah. So customers can pick the item. They can get it wrapped whichever they want. <coughs> they can obviously get it shipped to themselves, or they can send it. Customized anyway. packaging that you can choose this color. You can choose this. No, for example, if if someone says I want to gift Bombay Shaving Company a razor, this and this, and yeah. just and these yeah. three things. Just three things in a bag. Yes. Oh wow! Really? Yeah. yeah. So, so it's not on the brand to kind of. give you five customized skews of gifts no you will let yeah. customers do it yes we'll charge the customers push for sure. yeah. gifting yeah. me to matlab that's yeah. completely okay it's very clearly value adding right yeah yeah good wow but what uh, what next i'll be like what what do the next what do the next 10 years look like for you um and let's let's come to that first i have a follow on question but what what do like what 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 excites you about the next time you like what do you really see this becoming long term yeah uh, i think whatever i imagine like i think i'm going to dream smaller than what i should uh, in that case i don't really have expectations of the next 10 years to be honest really right i would rather like you know the things get better we do better uh, we are making b- bigger better impact uh, i think keep the focus and the eye level there right just sort of one foot in front of the other uh, instead of trying to live up to some expectation that we build up and being either disappointed or you know i think that's a waste of your own uh, mental health uh, so i think i would like to be sort of you know more active uh, healthier you know m- even more engaged in business mm. right uh, and really sort of look forward to seeing uh, the next you know how many better and bigger people we build up uh, within the organization people that are going to actually you know that are that have gotten groomed that are uh, doing well some of the folks which will come in and then they will build up as well so i think those are general kicks in life mm. right nothing uh, making someone successful like making your team successful yeah yeah i think that will be good fun right So I think that's how our business will get better. We have for sure better people. It's all about leverage, no? Yeah, you know, it's all about leverage. No, absolutely. So mm-hmm. I think see your way of paying it forward. For us, it's uh, like uh, one of the good things I think we did in the past few months is you know we started this program of opening up our office space to uh, emerging brands. To be honest, like I have been extremely positively surprised how many people are actually taking it up. Yeah, we thought ki ha yar people will. you know we will open up our office space for emerging brands some people will you know come maybe just because they need office space uh, but we find that people are actually spending a lot of time meaningful time in our office right because of, of course they are also coming there because they have work but they also know that you know uh, there is some level of insight that they can get uh, and for us for me personally that has become uh, a great sort of you know this brownian motion of just running into these folks that i know that they're <laughs> building brands and just seeing them in the office yeah. like you had come the other day yeah. but like that was we were meeting the entire team was yeah. meeting and all of that stuff but uh, you know somebody or the other is always in the office i think yesterday i ran into two founders in the office and for us that is actually a great way to sort of pay yeah. it forward in the community that you know we will help these brands emerge and i think getting these folks to work out of office just like you're doing has been a uh, really good thing for our team as well yeah right they see is, yeah. they see smart people in the office uh, who are building brands it changes their thought process about you know also emerging brands who they want to really really help make successful yeah. right because otherwise in our business it's very easy because everything said and done emerging brands i think overall as pl- part of the gov is still a very very small number yeah. right it's very easy to put your entire focus on 
uh, what's happening with the larger brands, yeah. what's happening with the levers and the PNGs of the world, which is important. Yeah. But you know, uh, it is. We have to sort of figure out that balance of being able to give enough due credit to create new markets. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's been a really good revelation for us, like just having these young smart folks in the office. Completely well. agree. Completely agree. And they're like, it reminds me of genuinely. Like I think I've changed from what I used to be seven years back. I used like I was 28 when I started. I'm 35 now, 36 now, right? So um, for me, like I, I don't want to lose the enthusiasm of day one. Hmm. It's very easy to say it's still day one and all that. I genuinely feel like you change and you know as companies become bigger. Um, there is a certain amount of legacy inertia that starts setting in. And obviously priorities change. Your appetite for mistakes is a lot lower, right? Um, so you change, but you shouldn't like the childlike enthusiasm that that the team has. Hmm. I think gets invigorated when you see people who are actually in on, uh, on day one. So it's actually very cool. And you get to learn a lot. But I think the broader market is a very tricky thing right now. Like every new founder is kind of People are not taking the leap into entrepreneurship today the way they were a year back. Mm -hmm. Just kind of waiting a few months or six months, eight months to for because capital is completely people have tied up. Uh, you know, lot of early stage businesses that were funded last year or the year before, who had like kind of raised one or two years of runway, suddenly are approaching the end of that runway and seeing a market where capital is not available or at least not at values. Even great businesses are raising at very suboptimal value mm -hmm. uh, today. So, what is your view on like you've seen cycles before, mm -hmm. right? You've, you've, you've even including the dot com, uh, the you know, uh, GFC and the dot com. So you've kind of seen it uh, in, in you know across not only as an entrepreneur but even before. Um, what's your view on this one? Like this one seems trickier. Like this one seems trickier than what it was six seven years back. I think six seven years back was hard times. Right. This is a downturn. And it's like a it is a downturn. Yeah. Right. Six, seven years ago it was, you know, funding is harder, people will pull money. Or, yeah. Uh see, a lot of the businesses which at least uh there was a lot of money in the market in twenty one and yeah. early part of twenty two. Like just insane amounts of money. Uh so I think there would have been subpar businesses which got funded as well. Yeah. Right. Uh but I think that's okay that culling is going to happen. Right, some businesses will have to die. Right, uh, the healthier ones will survive. I don't think that any founder should ever think that unless I can raise capital in this environment, I should not start the business. Mm. Right, uh, and that's my belief. Maybe it is misplaced. Uh, maybe it's dependent on everybody's own personal situation. Um, when we started, we did not raise on day one. We did not raise for, I think, almost a year into our operations, right? Uh, the mindset was not that we will not do this business unless somebody is ready to invest. And I think that was happening for the last two years, right? Uh, you should, if you are convinced about the opportunity, the space, you should get started, take care of your personal expenses on your own or figure out a way around it and then but you sort of get started. Uh, get working and worry about the capital part later mm -hmm. right uh, so i think that's one that you know people should start businesses during this time uh, because the objective of the business is to make money it is not to raise money yeah. right and that's something that we seem to have lost in but the last yeah. few years i think uh, second thing which <coughs> i think is that you know this culling even if uh, there are some businesses which are going to shut down is going to be okay because I think macro, even with the downturn, it's just going to be a maybe like a temporary slowdown or whatever. But we are going towards uh, a higher, you know, we are going to have more people get to a better stage in life. There are going to be more opportunities created for businesses uh, to be built. And I think that's a 10, 15, 20 year view that you should take and sort of go behind that, right? Uh, I think this is going to be still a temporary blip. It might last for two years, right? In fact, you know, uh, but I think there are going to be healthy businesses which will get built during this period. Uh, even businesses like ours, we have to double down on uh, figuring out more efficiencies faster. Yeah. 
right? Uh, doesn't matter how much capital we have in the bank. We have to utilize this period to really, really sort of become better, yeah. right? Uh, and I think that holds true across the board. Smaller businesses, larger businesses, doesn't really matter. So, uh, so I, that's sort of what I think. That if you're going to start up in this environment, you should just start up. Yeah. And it's probably good because you're going to have less competition. Yeah. Incredible. Any final, final words of advice? No, man. Just to be, be good, be kind. <laughs> Amazing. It's been a pleasure having you. Yeah. Today's conversation has just kind of flown by. Um, I'm also doing this after a while. Uh, so it's really good to, to do it, but I think you've built something truly special. Um, Thank you. And uh, I think, but I think, I, like, I think the the growth of Blinkit and and, uh, and and what your team is doing is still more. I think your, your best years are ahead of you, in my view. I really hope so. And uh, <laughs> because the love, alternative will suck. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, and I love that Bombay Shaving Company and Bombay are a part of yeah, part yeah. of what you guys are doing. And thank uh, you so much for. Way. For you know, putting up with. I think it took us a while to <laughs> to get you guys on board and like work with you. But uh, I think now we have meaningful folks working with you. And, and I guess growth is growth is good. Yeah, and I wish you guys the best. Same here. I think you guys will do great things. Thank you so much. We do have a hamper for you and your nice. team. Uh, nice. One second. I'm just gonna. Are we gonna take a photo? Yes. <laughs> So we have done the same thing. Like we kind of without we've not made the packaging modular. Nice. We'll come with something like this. Nice. And then huh. it's kind of there'll be like a bunch of things. Yeah. This is for you, but I think we just go with Joe here, they can kind of nice. gift it. Oh, you try the first one. Huh.